I'm telling you, Robbie, Robbie undersells it, man. He, his vacation was pretty good. What, ask him to tell you the shark story and about the revival he got. Should I tell the shark story? <laughs> do it. Should I tell the shark story? Do it. <laughs> so we get to the beach. Did you all hear about that shark story where the lady got bit by the shark? That was like right now, like right in front of us. Like it was there happening, right? I walk up. This lady's getting bit by a shark, right? I help drag her out of the ocean. And that's not even the craziest part of the story. I turn around. Because, you know, what better time once they send her off the ambulance to start preaching? We had like 14 people get saved on the beach. Can you believe that? Can you believe that? And then they were crazy enough to walk back off in that shark-infested water and get baptized. No, that didn't happen. I'm just kidding. I am just kidding. That didn't happen. But Jan's wife probably holds a grudge because I shared that story this morning in the foyer with her. And she was just picking up what I was laying down. <laughs> And I think I she might have dumb to do chills. I mean, all over her she body. Did. And the... I knew I was in trouble. She's like, I got, I got Holy Ghost bumps on me. That's so amazing. And I'm like, I got to tell her the truth. I lied. That's what I did. She's like, oh, I don't like you anymore. But that's the shark story. All right, class. The lesson there is don't believe Rob. He's still now choking. Man, it is so awesome to be with you guys again. Um, look around at this church because you are blessed. There are places, cities in Illinois that don't have churches that are rocking and rolling and God is moving in like this church here. I'm telling you, God has his hand on you. He has his hand on what you guys are doing here. And I can't wait to see that fire start spreading throughout all Illinois. So don't cap what you guys can do as a church. Don't cap it. <sighs> all right. Hey, when you guys were little kids, did you ever th dream about doing something great like you knew what you wanted to be as, as a little kid, right? You know, like a firefighter, uh, a police officer, a soldier, uh, I don't know. What else? Could, a veterinarian. I think one of my kids wanted to be a veterinarian. Do you guys do that to you? Like, think you wanted to be one of those when you were a kid? Yeah. Yeah, three of you guys. I appreciate the participation. It's awesome. Uh, so, like, I did the same thing, except my, I wanted to be the invisible man. Right? Youngest of seven, you get that, right? I wanted to be the invisible man, but my parents said there's kind of an evolution there because one Halloween I said I wanted to be the vacuum cleaner uh, so I could suck up all the candy. But then I realized the invisible man was a little bit cooler than that. And uh, so I could walk into rooms, no one would see me, and my big brother can't punch what he can't see, right? That's all I'm saying. I'm smart. Uh, and then I could grab all the candy and run back out. But then I thought about that as a career, and I was like, I don't know, man, because I could be like, I just saved that guy's life. I pulled the shark lady out, and the shark lady would be like, what just happened? So I wouldn't get any props, but what I really, really wanted to be, and I landed on this finally, was Superman. Who wanted to be Superman when they were a kid? Dads? Come on. You know you did. No, Batman people. I get it. That's okay. We all know who wins that fight. Anyways, so I wanted to be Superman, and I was the kid that totally wore my underwear on the outside of my pants, it's tough to put a towel on the back of my shirt, and jumped off the furniture, and my mom would yell at me to stop doing it, all because I wanted to be Superman. Because Superman is cool. Think about that. He had that, that motto, was it? Faster than a speeding bullet, stronger than a locomotive, able to leap tall buildings in a single bound, able to wear a ballet outfit in public, and no one laughed at him. That's legit. He was the man of steel. He was never afraid. He was never confused. He didn't need therapy. He was amazing. And he had x-ray vision. I wanted x-ray vision. So I could see where all the candy was, right? Candy is a big theme in my life. You'll find that out. But most of all, I wanted that superhero chest. I'm talking 1950s Superman, you know, before they had the weird added muscles in the suit. He had this huge chest and he had the S on it. I wanted to be big and strong like Superman, but God said, nope, you're going to be short and ruddy. And so I just had to do it. But here's the greatest discovery we can make is that we don't have to be Superman or Superwoman to make a big difference in this world. That the God who created this whole ball of wax who gave us the Bible says that he has created each and every one of us with gifts and abilities where we can make a difference in this world and live a life of significance. So I want to take you guys on a little journey. We're going to cross a couple of bridges. This is a low-budget sermon. I usually put a picture of a bridge on the screen, but I couldn't afford it. 
So just imagine a bridge. This is, you can be your own bridge. You can make it however you want to. You can put a little troll underneath it. I don't care. But we're going to go on a bridge, and we're going to call this bridge the search bridge. And we're going to start out in a place called the land of aspiration. Uh, this is where you start your life wanting to do something really great. You know, it's when you're in your late teens, early 20s. You know, some of you are in college. Some of you guys are at home. But you believe you can change the world. You can save the Yeti and the Serengeti. You can, you can go out and save spider monkeys in the jungle. You can do all kinds of things because you really believe that your life can mean something. There's nothing that you can't do. You have great dreams. You are searching for meaning in your life. And there's always some sort of excitement at that age when you're in that moment. But then something changes. Something changes in all of our lives. And it's not just getting a mortgage or having to do carpool. Something changes in our hearts where we go from wanting to do something great to wanting to be someone great. And all of a sudden, we change what matters in life. And we say we want achievement, success, and greatness. And our life is measured by, can we make that achievement? Can we get that success? Can we get that greatness? Can I have the nicest car, the nicest house, the biggest house? Can I have the latest iPhone? Can I get the latest and greatest whatever it is? We change. I call this the land of boredom. Because you're kind of caught in this bizarro world of Groundhog Day where you're not thriving, you're just surviving. This is where you go and you say things like, oh, I used to be an idealist, but now I'm just a realist about what can happen in life. It's where you lose that wonder of what could be. You live in the land of boring because you wake up every morning, you get dressed, you feed the kids breakfast, wash dishes, head off to the office or wherever you work, you get back home, you make dinner, get the kids dressed for bed, put them to bed, go to sleep, wake up the next day, and it just goes over and over and over again because you are just so driven for achievement, success, and greatness. And the greatest tragedy is that there are people living today in this room, up on this stage, that are living in the land of boredom. And the land of boredom, the real crime, is all the unfulfilled potential that God has given. Where... We've given up on those dreams of changing the world. We just have. How can I do it? It's a big world. We've given up on, on living beyond what we can see in front of us. We've just stopped having excitement about life. And why does the search bridge turn into such a, a terrible thing at the end? Why does it just flip a switch where you go from being the most optimistic, excited, believing person to being ah, bored? Life hits you. And then it hits you again, and it hits you again. And then we don't realize it, but we're like a computer with a virus. You get a computer, you turn it on, and it starts doing weird things. And you shut it off, you put run antivirus, you do all that stuff. But there's something on there that has broken the system. And the virus is selfishness. Because when you get beat up in life, all of a sudden you start thinking about how much that hurt you. How much that changed your life. And you stop thinking about everybody else. You go from saying, I want to do great things to I want to be someone great. And this bridge is depressing because you are not living the life God has created you to live. And most people don't know they're living in the land of boredom. So I want to give you a little, a little quiz here. Yeah, well, not a little quiz. Give you some, a couple of different things. If life is all about you, if it's about your achievements, your success, if it's about watching your shows all the time, if it's about what, uh, doing what you want to do, when you want to do it, how you want to do it, and it doesn't matter. Because you want to be the top of the pile. You want to be Superman so you can sign the autographs. You want to be in the spotlight. And if that's you, don't feel like you're alone. Because 2,000 years ago, there were guys that actually walked this earth with Jesus who wanted the same thing. Jesus' closest followers, the disciples, 
were also on this bridge. Listen to what it says in the, in the book of Mark. And Jesus and disciples were traveling and they're heading to a house and it says this. When they got to the house, Jesus asked them, he's talking to his followers, the disciples here, what were you arguing about on the road? But they kept quiet because on the way, they had argued about who was the greatest. He sat down and called them around him and said, anyone wanting to be the greatest must be the least, the servant of all. Can you imagine this? Jesus is walking down the road. It's kind of like we're on a, a road trip with our kids, right? We know what they're arguing about in the back, right? But Jesus knew because he was God, right? And they're arguing about who is going to be the greatest in the kingdom of God. Who is going to be it? And so they're saying, they're acting like four-year-olds. I want to be Superman. No, you be Superman. I want to be Superman. You were Superman last week. You be Donkey Man. And then just, just, and Jesus is like, I'm going to turn this caravan around. You know, and it's like, why? And Jesus says, time out. Okay, guys, like Zach Morris, just straight up time out time. He says, I know you want to be great. I know you want to be great, my God. My father has put that inside of you to want to be great. But greatness doesn't become who you're in charge of. Greatness isn't about how much you have. Greatness is about how much you serve. The only way you're going to be great in this life to have some significance is if you serve. And they were blown away by this because their world, like our world, that's not how it works. Because it's the more stuff that you acquire, the more money, the more clout, the more influence, whatever you acquire makes you great. But that's not how the kingdom of God works. It's hard sometimes to illustrate these things. But I remember a story I heard about Muhammad Ali. His whole tagline, he said it all the time. If you watch any interviews with him, he says, I am the greatest he was no doubt a great boxer. He was no doubt, you know, he stung like a bee and flew like a butterfly. I don't remember what it was, but it was really cool when he said it. But I heard a story about him that just made me giggle a little bit. So Muhammad Ali gets on a plane. He sits down and the flight attendant says, excuse me, sir, you need to buckle your seatbelt. He looks up and says, I'm Muhammad Ali. I'm the greatest. He says, sir, it's kind of the rules. Can you buckle your seatbelt, please? She says, Superman didn't need no seatbelt. I don't need one either. She said, Superman didn't need a plane either. <laughs> she must have been a Southwest flight attendant. <laughs> Occasionally, self-proclaimed greatness runs into reality. The Bible says this. Your greatness isn't about, uh, built around your narcissism. Your greatness in life is not paved with egocentricity and where it's all about you. Greatness and significance in your life is paved with serving. And Jesus didn't even just talk about serving as, and just like, eh, I served. I told the shark story and I really didn't do it, but it was funny anyways, right? No, that's not what Jesus did. What Jesus did is he says, I'm going to serve you so much and so hard that it's going to lead me to a cross where I will be beaten and crucified for your sins. And then I will give you a way out. And Jesus' bridge is serving, because listen to this. This is what it says in Luke 9, 46. Anyone who takes care of, little, of a little child like this is caring for me. And whoever cares for me is caring for God who sent me. Your care for others is the measure of your greatness. Push that other bridge out of your mind right now. Light it on fire, whatever. We'll come back to it later, but just, light, just push it out of your brain. We're going to go to another bridge. It's called the serving bridge. And the starting point for the serving bridge, this side of the bridge, is it starts with me. Not me. You, me. So you, you. Where we realize we are selfish. That we can't get over this bridge on our own. That we need help. We need a savior. We need someone else. This is where we recognize that our search for significance was all about us before. Jesus gives us a, a, an easy equation. 
If you want to be significant in this life, serve. And here's the point. Significance is where our aspirations meet divine purpose. Because we get a limited amount of time on this earth. 100 years, give or take 30, right? Where we don't want to wake up one day and say, what did I do with my life? What did I do with this life that God gave us on this earth? What did I do? No one wants to do that. We want something different for our lives. We want something different for our kids' lives. We don't want to wander through life and never accomplish anything because that's not how God made us. God made us to do stuff in this life. I wrote this in my journal the other day, and I just wanted to share it with you. I want something different between now and when I get to heaven. I want to make the most of what I've got. I want to make the most of my time and my life and my talents. Jesus said, if you want significance, you serve. So when do I serve, Mark? When do I serve? 24-7. 24-7. 365 days a week. Every day, every minute, every hour. You're looking at me like, dude, it's Father's Day. No. That's a lot of serving. Here's the deal. If you look at serving as a checklist, you're doing it wrong. You gotta flip that script and change the way you're looking at serving because serving, in fact, is how Jesus molds us through the Holy Spirit into being more like him. And that's the goal of the Christian life, right? That's the goal. Listen to this, this verse in Mark. If you want to try to keep your life for yourself, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake and for the sake of the good news, you will find life. If you hold on to it, if you hold on to your life for yourself, you're never going to realize what God wants for you. You're never going to become like Jesus, and you're going to miss out on what you could have been. I don't know if they have a highlight reel up in heaven when you get there, but I don't want mine just to be the black screen. I want to see that I did something. And so some of us in, in the room think, oh man, well, I go to church every week. Eh, every six weeks, maybe. And I sit there, and I sit sour and soak in the service but I don't do anything else outside of that, then you're not growing spiritually. You are not growing spiritually. Let me help you out. Here's a little self-evaluation. I did this just for you dads on Father's Day. Let me ask you a question. Don't answer out loud. This first one will answer itself for me. Where do you serve at home? I saw a couple elbows like this, dad, so you're welcome. Where do you serve at work? Where do you serve in the community? Where do you serve at home? I mean at church. Oh, Mark, this is it. This is the hard sell, right? This is where you tell me I'm going to go work in the kids' ministry and change diapers and stuff like that. No. No. I don't care if you serve at Redemption. I don't care if you serve at any church. God has his hand on this church, whether you realize it or not, and he is going to move his purposes forward with redemption, whether you serve or not, with or without you. If God wants it, it's happening. And you can choose to get on that wave and surf it, or you can sit on the shore and miss out. As a pastor, though, I want you to serve because I want you to become more like Jesus. Because if you're not serving, if you're not changed to be more like Jesus, you are not growing so I want to help you guys out. I want to, I want to just eliminate excuses because I know everybody has excuses why they can't do this. So if we're going to get into the game, we've got to eliminate excuses. And we think that we have an excuse that maybe God hasn't heard before, right? That, that we're like original. But if you look at the Bible, all the way through it, people are giving excuses. Look at Adam and Eve in the beginning, right? They, they had this beautiful garden. There was no sin in the world. Everything was perfect. They got to hang out with the animals all day. And then they ate the fruit. And Eve's like, he told me to. And then Adam's like, the woman you gave me, God, told me to do it. He straight up gaslit God. Yeah, yeah, that's pretty low, right? Think about that. Think about that. Then you look even further. You, go, you keep reading the Bible and you run into Moses. 
Moses. God wanted to use him to take the children of Israel out of exile and slavery. God had equipped him in his trials and tribulations in life to do this. And you know what Moses does? But uh, I'm not a good speaker, God. Um, I, 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 I can't do it. See, when my knee goes like this, it makes a clicking sound. And I, it hurts. And my beard feels weird. I think I might have a virus or some sort of mold in it. And he just made up excuses. Some of those are in the Bible. Most of them aren't. But it's like, he made up these excuses over and over again why he could not do what God had for him to do in life. And we do the same thing. But in the New Testament, this excuse takes up the cake, takes the cake. I mean, it is just ridiculous. In John 5, there's this place in Israel called the Pool of Bethesda. And there was this tradition that if you were sick and you went to the Pool of Bethesda, and when the water started moving around hot tub style, if you were the first one in, you would be healed by an angel of God. So people would go there who were sick and hurting and wanting to have their life changed. And there's this one guy that Jesus ran into who had been waiting for 38 years by this pool of Bethesda to be healed. 38 years! Some of you in the room aren't even 38 years old. Think about it. And so Jesus sees him in John chapter 5, and he's, he, he goes up to him and he asks him a question like Jesus usually does. When Jesus saw him and knew how long he, he had been ill, he asked him, would you like to get well? 38 years. Would you like to get well? And that's kind of the same thing I'm asking you today. Do you want to become more like Jesus? Do you want to get well? Do you want to have a life of significance? This is how that dude answered him. I can't, sir, the man said, for I have no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirred up. And the Bible doesn't really give good voiceovers, I think, sometimes. And then when you get people to read them to you, they're just like robot voices. I think this was like a tiny Tim kind of voice here. Sir, I can't get into the water. You know, and it's like, shut up, whiny boy. Get up and walk. Take your mat and go. Jesus probably didn't do it that way because he's a much better person than I am. But that's, that's what we're thinking here. It's like, what is your excuse? Why aren't you living a life of significance? What keeps you on the sideline? What keeps you at the end of the bridge Well, it's still all about you? What excuse do you have? This church is too big. They don't need me. Everything's covered. I mean, look at this place. It's got big screens and TVs and fantastically huge keyboards and their pastor is so popular. Everybody loves him. Why would they need me? And plus, I'm busy. My kids in club soccer. My daughter is like, all the time she's gone, she's got 17 different clubs she's got to be at. Dude, I got like four play dates on Sundays and that's the only day they can do it. We're all busy, right? By a show of hands, how many people say they're pretty busy? They're pretty busy in life. Yeah, yeah. The other half of you are YouTubers, I'm taking. taking that? Okay. All right, just checking, just checking. But when my oldest son, and I'm going to tell a story, and I wanted to let you know, he's 19 now, he's a cadet at West Point, so he turned out okay. You know what I mean? Yeah, but when he was 13 years old, I remember I came home from work one time, and he says, Dad, check this out. And he brings his iPhone to me. He's like, check out my Spotify playlist, man. I got like 20,000 songs. I line them up for this playlist. It's amazing. Dad, you're going to love it. And I'm like, dude, this is, this is a lot of songs. Holy cow. How long does this take you? He says, dude, I've been working on it for like two weeks, Dad. Okay, maybe three weeks. And I'm like, oh, well, that explains why the yard's not mowed why your room's a mess, and why you probably haven't handed in any homework. And he's like, oh, yeah, and I met a spreadsheet, man, so you can see the genres, too. That's when I knew he would go to West Point. That was just the moment. And I'm like, I'm like, dude, imagine what you could have done. Can you take this Spotify playlist to heaven? As a pastor's kid, he gave the right answer. No. I'm like, do you think if you would have used this time for something better in life, that God will reward you when you get to heaven? Yes. 
so what do you think? He looks at me, he goes, <laughs> walks off. I thought he would be like, oh, you're such a great dad. Thank you for this wisdom. You're my Jedi master. No, ungrateful. <laughs> Here's the thing. We all have excuses, but this is the thing we don't do. We don't name them. We don't say, I'm busy, God. I give this to you. God, I have commitments. I can't do it. I give this to you. Because where we are weak, God is strong. Listen to what the Apostle Paul says in 2 Corinthians. For when I'm weak, then I am strong. Embrace your limitations that you are not a superman and you are not a superwoman. You're human beings that God has created you to be in relationship with him. <sighs> I want to remove another excuse for you, okay? You're like, well, where do I serve? Well, serve here. Look, Robbie loves QR codes. I'm serious. I think he is going to like tattoo a QR code on himself. So when he comes up here, you guys can scan him. Here's the deal. I bet you if you scan that QR code, you could find a place to serve. There's no excuse. You go on your app and you, you have that little chat thing say, I want to serve. Actually, just put SEV. They'll figure it out. There is no excuse where you can't find a place to serve here. And you're like, oh, dude, but like you said, this church is big. They have everything they could possibly need. Look, start small. It's okay to start with small things. God is a genius at turning things that are very tiny into things that are amazingly big and meaningful. And we forget that. Loads of fishes. The widow's might. Remember the widow gave her last little coin, put it in the box, and Jesus said, that's, that's what it's about. She gave it all. What she had, she gave it all. It was just a little thing to them. But to God, it was big. And Jesus says this in Matthew. I love this. Even if you give a cup of cold water to one of the least of my followers, you will surely be rewarded. You don't have to get up here on stage, write your own music, and start singing in acoustic style. Start small. Because we have this thing in our society that's kind of crept into the church where we say, go big or go home. But God doesn't say that. That's guilt that you're putting on yourself. And if you say, I can't do anything because I can't do anything significant for the church, you're falling into that trap. You're falling into that trap. Name it. Tell God. The way that this whole thing works is a whole bunch of people doing a million little things. People who blow bubbles for the little kids inside the toddler class and they love and they jump up and they pop all of them after they read them a Bible story. The mom who puts a Band-Aid on a kid who's not hers and says, it's okay and gives them a hug and sends them on their way. The, the dad who coaches soccer just so he can share the gospel. Every person, every person who is out there greeting you when you walk in, those guys put a lot of work into that. They have fresh donuts for both services. So that means if they don't eat them all at the first service, they have to eat them themselves. So if that's not motivation to join that team, I don't know what is. First Chronicles 28 says this, the Lord sees every heart and understands and knows every plan and thought. God is looking for your heart, not the size of what you can do. I remember when I was a young pastor way back in the 1900s, and uh, we had just opened up a new building, and it was beautiful. It was a gorgeous building. Everything was just state-of-the-art at the time. Probably even had VHS. <laughs> I know, it's terrible. <laughs> But I got in the building, and it was my first time to be up on stage. The senior pastor had done all this stuff, and it was just kind of that, that nervousness of being in a new place. So I got there so I could see, you know, how the stage felt, found any wires so I wouldn't trip over them. And then I started to hear this noise in the background. I'm like, what is that noise? It's going to drive me nuts. It's like, this is a brand new building. Nothing should be going... So I start looking around. I start looking up. I'm looking around. I'm like trying to find people texting them on the phone. I'm the executive pastor. I'm supposed to be the one that knows about that noise and how to fix it, but I don't. So as I walk through the auditorium, I look up, and there's a guy on his hands and knees, like halfway up. And he's got a pencil sharpener 
And I don't know if you remember the days of analog where you use golf pencils to fill things out. He was up there sharpening them. I'll tell you what. That seemed like something small, but the dude was decked out. He had knee pads, he had arm guards. I mean, I think he even wore goggles. I don't know. But he was sharpening those pencils, and it meant something to the kingdom. None of the kids in our youth group would have been able to pass notes to the girl they liked if that guy hadn't have sharpened those pencils. And none of the people that accepted Jesus or requested baptism could have checked that box if he didn't sharpen those pencils. So when we moved to pins, we kind of like ruined his life. I know. So that's why we let him clean the communion cups. <laughs> we have a lot of people doing a million little things to make church happen. And here's the point Jesus was making. You see a need, then you meet it. That's the equation for significance. It's not small to God. Here's a warning. There are Christians in this room that serve all the time. Better hear every day, every week doing the same job because no one else can do it better. And you've turned your Superman complex into a Messiah complex. And you're not able to see how that serving is changing you to be more like Jesus because you're tired and you don't rest and you don't see what God is doing in your life. In the busiest time of ministry, it's okay to take a break because someone else in this room will step up and take your spot. Jesus, I talked about this last week too, when the disciples were in their busiest time of ministry, when things were happening, there were so many people, they couldn't even walk down the street. It was hard for them to get away. In Mark 6, 32, it says, the apostles returned to, to Jesus from their ministry tour and told him all they had done and what they had taught. Then Jesus said, let's get away from the crowds for a while and rest. There were so many people coming and going that Jesus and his apostles didn't even have time to eat they left by boat for a quieter spot. You need to rest too. To see what God is doing in your life. Engage him in prayer. Engage him in time of reflection of how he has changed your world. And there's a final bridge. It's the bridge of surrender. And for some of us, we've accepted Jesus. We've prayed the prayer. We bought the fire insurance, right? But that's as far as we went. God has more for your life. Do not get caught in the land of boredom. Some of us have never asked Jesus to change our world and become the, the boss of our life, to become our savior. We're walking around and our, our life is a hot mess and we don't know why. And I'm telling you right now today, it's because you do not have Jesus in your life. Because with Jesus comes a family where you're all working together to see how God is doing great things in this community, in this world. And you can stop being a cynic and you can start seeing where God is changing things your life will change because you'll no longer want the old things. If you want that change in your life, you can scan the QR code, you can come up here to the altar when they play the music and you pray, someone will pray with you. You can talk to anybody that has a t-shirt that says anything redemption on it. We could probably help you. But today could be your day. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you so much for all that you've done for us. Thank you that you are a God that listens to our excuses and doesn't laugh at us. Thank you that you are a God that forgives us. Thank you for you are a God who wrote on our hearts, on our DNA, to do something in life significant, to do something greater than ourselves. And mostly, thank you for dying on a cross so that our hearts can change, so that we can serve and we can do the little things that turn into big things in your kingdom. Thank you, God. Name me pray. Amen.